I think stroke, it's uh, first of all, probably one of the most uh, impressive uh, recent advances in neuroradiology. Last four years, we've seen mechanical thrombectomy, so the endovascular treatment of stroke coming from uh, um, technique, from being a technique that was on validation to now standard of care and one of the most effective treatments in medicine. We, a big part of the stroke treatment is select the right patient that will truly benefit from the treatment. Because the brain when it's suffering, uh, when there is a clot that is preventing the blood to perfuse the brain, over time you have the, a stroke that will happen and if the stroke is too big, if you, when you remove the clot and you reestablish the flow, it will not be, it will be too late. So we use imaging to select which patients have, will, have a, will carry a small stroke, will have a big stroke, and patients that will have a potential to, to recover well after the treatment. What is the quality, specific clinical and technical quality of that kind of imaging that would give you that information? Today we can do C CT, we can do MRI, and those two techniques that is, you can do imaging to see the core, to see the stroke itself, and you can do perfusion to see the mismatch, so it's a more elaborate image. Uh, and today, if you use the best imaging quality that we have, which is MRI, you will have a very good imaging setup. The logistic problem that we have is that not every hospital is set up to do MRIs in emergency for stroke patients. So it, it's time consuming and we know that time is brain and time is, uh, if your system is not implemented to do MRIs for stroke, it's, it's, not, it's not the ideal imaging. So most of the centers today, probably 80-90% of the centers in the world, they use CT. And CT, we can use the basic CT with CT8 as the vascular imaging and some centers have been adding perfusion or not. This is the current setup of imaging selection in most of the centers. But I think the, the direction now is towards decrease the time from the patient arrival in the hospital to the angel, to the treatment itself. And one of our research topics lately and research activities has been to improve the imaging quality of the angel suite, the angel room, to also select patients for stroke. So a patient, today a current workflow is a patient come to emerge, gets the imaging, the team meets there and then the patient is transferred to the angel lab. So this intra-facility transportation can take more than an hour. And we believe that if we implement or improve the imaging inside the angel room, those patients should better be taken directly there, being triaged, imaged there for stroke. And if they are good candidates for treatment, we are already inside the place that we will perform the treatment. So the time from the arrival in the hospital will significantly decrease and to the benefit of the patient that will then be treated as quick as possible. So it's not so much of, uh, an evolution in the imaging, but an evolution in perhaps the architecture of the actual lab. Yeah, and also on the process itself, because the angel labs today, we have the best image to see the vessels to do the procedures. But the imaging to see the brain itself, it's, I think it was rudimentary and now is getting to a point that is very good. You will see at some of the presentations here in the conference that, uh, that will we'll show some of the images that we have now in our lab, that we can have imaging quality in the angel room, similarly to the best CTs that we have today. So, and also with perfusion, with all the advanced image that you will have on the, in the eMERGE, you will be able to have it inside your cash lab. I think it's a great, great advance. And I think if we have this implemented in all angel labs worldwide, I think uh, this, will be, this will be a great uh, improvement in the workflow in general of, of the stroke care.
I think today we are reaching a point where the treatment for aneurysms is quite is very safe, carry a low risk. We have a lot of new devices and beautiful technology that we can offer a safe treatment for most of the aneurysms. But now, uh, on the other hand, we have a high number of patients with aneurysms that have been diagnosed because we have availability of imaging worldwide. And we know that most of these patients will carry a lesion, an aneurysm, that does not have any risk of rupture. So they could stay with them, just be followed, uh, because they would carry a very low risk over the patient lifetime. So now there is a big uh, work on the research side as well to develop imaging, new imaging methods to evaluate those patients with small aneurysms that we don't know yet what will be the risk for that aneurysm, for that specific patient in the lifetime. So we have uh, a special type of uh, imaging sequencing using MRI that's called vessel image. So we've been using this imaging to see if there is any inflammation on the wall of the aneurysm. Uh, and we also have been using computational fluid dynamics. So we simulate the flow inside the aneurysm and we look for specific parameters that may indicate that that lesion may carry a risk of rupturing in the future. We've been driving a number of studies, including a big study that will start soon in Canada, in almost all centers uh, across the country, in which we will observe and treat the patients, and we use these advanced imaging techn techniques before and after, and, and try to get more information in which groups will be unstable and deserve treatment and which groups will be safe and stable. What, what is your definition of a, a small aneurysm or a large aneurysm? What is the, the, the clinical definition? Yeah. In general, overall across the different locations is 7 millimeters. So we consider 7 millimeters a threshold for risk for, for, for size. So below 7 millimeters is a small aneurysm, an aneurysm that carries a low risk. Above 7 millimeters is usually an aneurysm that carries a high risk. So some small aneurysms, depending on the shape, if they are irregular, they may also carry a high risk. Some locations like anterior communicating artery, basilar tip, or a small artery called pica, those areas we tend to treat even when they are between 4 to 7 millimeters because we know that they will carry a higher risk. So this is what we know current now, and this is how we base most of our treatment decisions. But in the future, we want to expand this concept and also use, use these advanced, advanced imaging methods that I just described to you. Because I imagine that those, that would also help in the choice of the device you use. And yep, that's a very good point. The computational fluid dynamics that's being used for patient selection for determination of the risk of the patient is also being used to, to test, to implant and to evaluate different devices for, for that specific aneurysm. And knowing that you have different methods of treating these aneurysms, you can beforehand and virtually test and evaluate the results that will be optimized to that specific patient. And, and get the best of it. What is going on, at least on the research side, is that a lot of new optimization methods have been in place. So we have different stents to treat a birthcation aneurysm, we have different devices to treat a birthcation aneurysm. And this is a good example because uh, a certain aneurysm, we could have probably 10 different good methods to treat, and you can virtually test each one of them, and we know which are the parameters that which parameters will, will give the best likelihood of stability and complete occlusion of that aneurysm. And you will see which device will be close and reach that, that parameter. Today, once you treat the aneurysm, what you don't, you don't want is a recurrence of this aneurysm. Different methods will carry different recurrence rates, but also sometimes if a method is very strong in occluding the aneurysm permanently, sometimes it will carry a bigger risk initially. So it's always a trade between risks and benefits and the evaluation of these techniques beforehand, virtually without testing or, or doing anything inside a patient, it's, it's useful because then you will get 
all, at least the most relevant hemodynamic parameters and, and use it in your favor and, and in favor of the patient. We will be following patients up to five years. So we will, uh, the design of the study is that every patient that has an aneurysm but is not ruptured will go to the study. The patients that will be considered at risk will be treated, but we will still observe the result of the treatment and their outcomes. The patients that will be considered not at risk, we will follow with the, the advanced imaging and probably some biomarkers, blood biomarkers, every year for five years minimum. And we plan to enroll a big number of patients, 2,000 patients in different centers. And what we want is to know from these aneurysms that at the beginning were considered to be safe, what will be the percentage of, of cases that will be unstable, so that will grow or rupture. And we want to build uh, scores and develop the imaging methods to detect those cases beforehand. So that will be the aim of the trial and how. So quite a bit of data coming out in the next six years. Yeah. And this is, I think, the future in medicine. We, we have like a whole statistical and epidemiological domain. It's called big data. And this is what, uh, what brings the most relevant parameters and studies that we have today. And big data perspective, this is very rare to have. And this is what I think we, all, we are all migrating to, to design smart studies that will keep the patient safe, but will also use the best of what we have in terms of diagnosis to better select these, these cases in the future. We will use AI in different steps in our, in our, in our study. And one of the, the areas that we've, we, we plan to use deep learning is on the evaluation of the shape, the, 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 of the aneurysm. And uh, we know that AI and, and the algorithms can, can work in our favor. And there is a lot of use of AI in medicine. And we, we have big plans for AI with our big data study because uh, with with whenever you you have data to improve your your deep learning algorithm you you will just make it better and better so yeah you we we will use a lot of ai uh, methods in our study and on the evaluation and on the creation of this course as well well we we look forward to talking to you about that and also about your robot experience maybe next year yes for sure yeah i'm happy to share with you